What's up guys, welcome to the Ozone and welcome to uh, a audiobook, uh, surprisingly. We're going to be reading uh, the stories from my competition that I did because you guys wanted this, you wanted audiobooks that you guys could read them yourselves as well. Um, if you want to read this then the link will be in the description. Uh, we're actually going to be reading the first story called The Music Box by Brian Yanko. So uh, c congratulations for for making the actual music box story in the music box book. Basically, this competition, if you didn't know, uh, I was hosting this competition uh, called Fazbear Writes. This is the first one, and there's a second one if you want to go and enter it now. Um, and in this competition, you have to write a story called the music box, uh, and this is the first one uh, that won out of three. So yeah, I think we should get straight to it. Let's go. Lucas never felt many emotions. He doesn't feel empathy. Actually, wait, hang on. I should probably zoom in because, you know, I can do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, the music box. Lucas never felt many emotions. He doesn't feel empathy or happiness. He doesn't really feel much of anything. And after since Lucas was born, or ever since Lucas was born, he was thought to be bad luck to be around. Everybody avoided him. Grade school bullies were always too scared to go near him, and friends, he didn't have any. It had been so bad that Lucas himself had believed he was cursed. Once something went badly, more and more would begin to happen. More and more got worse and worse. It couldn't be a coincidence, could it? He dwindled on the thought for years, until one year he was sure he was a walking disaster. At the age of 14, his parents and his two only friends were struck down in a series of grisly murders. Each and every body held a music box atop their chests, and every music box was broken beyond repair, shaped like a gift box. The police were desperate to find the serial killer, looking for fingerprints, shoe prints, anything that would lead them in the right direction. But the killer had always been the same way. He was never sloppy, and he was never stupid. The police searched and searched, though no clues ever sur surfaced, and nobody had ever been caught. Lucas, from that point on, knew he was cursed. He knew his lack of emotion, luck and family would shape him and his life. 32 years after the murders, he couldn't have been more correct. Lucas's uh, work phone rang from inside his large winter jacket. He was contemplating whether he should pick it up or not. He knew it would be another, call, another work call, that he'd have to go into the cold storm. He hated his work. Then again, he hated everything. With a soft groan, he took his phone out and accepted the call. For a few seconds, he watched the number rise on his phone screen. Midnight. One minute past midnight. Two minutes past midnight. Luke Lucas held the phone up to his left ear and started. This is lucky, private investigator, detective CSI. I can also be whatever you want for the right price. Oi oi, <laughs> he said sarcastically. He soon heard the call caller's voice. I am assuming, but this is the Lucas Grant I've heard. Sorry, I messed that up. I am assuming, but is this the Lucas Grant I've heard endless praise about? Yes? The man on the phone said, a sum of tone in his voice. Lucas sighed into the phone. This happens to be him. Yes. What's your name? What's your problem? Lucas asked calmly. The voice stalled long enough to notice, but soon spoke again. My name happens to be unimportant. A disastrous situation has broke out at Heavy Neville's field. Hurry along, Detective Grant. It's cold out there. We wouldn't want the music to stall for any longer, would we? The last words rang out and the call ended. The man hung up. Lucas knew very well who Heavy Neville was. He's had a lot of run-ins with the local police, though they were never able to take him to, into the station due to his horrible smelling body. He would walk around, smelling like rotten flesh, and look into people's windows. It didn't matter if your house was miles away, was behind a locked gate, or was private property. Heavy Neville would always find a way to leave his steamy hot breath on your windows. Nobody knows if he's drunk, creepy, or homeless. The stumbling, pale skin and rotting smell is leaning on the drunk. Lucas knew that Neville was a prime target. No family, no luck, no empathy. It reminded him of himself, as gross as that is. Thankfully, I'm not a heavy Neville myself, Lucas thought with a raspy chuckle. Lucas hopped in his old car and drove off to heavy Neville's field. 
When Lucas got to the field, he saw a police car was already parked. He could see two people surrounding a pile of dirt way up ahead. A giant electricity tower rose above them like the Eiffel Tower. He grabs his keys, snatches his handgun from the car door, and exits his car. After a long walk, uh, walk, eh, after a long walk he finally reaches the two people surrounding the pile of dirt. He recognised them as officers Gillian Taylor and Orson Race. He also finds that the pile of dirt is not a pile of dirt at all. It's the body of Heavy Neville. A miniature gift box lay atop his chest. Gillian and Orson walk over to Lucas. We're guessing you got a suspicious call too, Detective Grant, Orson asks Lucas. I've been made very aware that every officer, detective and political figure in the area has been called by the same individual. We haven't been able to track the caller's location, Gillian tells him. I assumed I had been targeted into coming here, Lucas mumbled. I recognise the killer's handiwork. We've also noticed some strange behaviour coming from the abandoned 80s building at the foot of the hill, Gillian says, Orson nodded, nodding in agreement. I'll check it out. I can't stand to stay here much longer. Lucas begins to walk away. Hold on. Take this with you. Orson hands him a walkie-talkie. Phone, uh, phone us if something happens and you need some backup. Lucas walks back down the hill towards the mossy building behind where he parked his car. The building, though abandoned for nearly 30 years, still kept paper flyers glued to their outside brick walls. Most were faded and torn from weather, some withheld the tests of time. Lucas read one, careful not to touch any moss growing on the wall. 1989, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, another, lost, another icon lost. Freddy's, a common tourist trap, was shut down last night due to unknown crimson stir... Oh my god. <laughs> was shut down last night due to unknown crimson substances found on and inside many animatronic suits. I'm sure detectives could go up there and be like, oh yeah, that's blood. But never mind. <laughs> Uh, there were also many health violations found within the kitchen, workplace and arcade rooms. Those violations will soon be made visible to the public. We are aware of the missing children reports, each stemming from this location, but we do not have enough evidence to begin an investigation within the establishment's walls. This building will not be solved, this building will not be maintained, this building will not be removed. Until we have further evidence, or lack thereof, this towering icon will rot for years to come. As for the animatronics, we are in talks with William Afton, not associated with the previous owner, runs his own robotics company, Afton Robotics, who will take them, repair them, and clean them. We hope to see another Freddy soon. Lucas scanned the other papers on the wall, though none of them were in as good condition as the one he read. He soon turned the corner of the building, making his way to the front door. Broken glass lay in front of the doorway, and he could smell the dust and spray paint inside. He walked inside, trying not to inhale too sharply. Sneezing wouldn't be the best idea if there's a killer hi hiding somewhere. The dark hall stretched far ahead of them, uh, though he swore he saw a light emerge for a split second. Lucas continued forward. After searching the first half of the building, oops, he started to notice a few strange things. The first thing he noticed was that there wasn't a single chair in the building. There were still tables, sure, but all the chairs were missing. The second thing was on the tables. There, on every single table, was a gift box. A gift box in the same shape and colour as the music box he dreaded. For the first time, he felt nervous. He felt scared. Lucas continued forward. Suddenly, after minutes of exploring, a flashlight leapt through the dark hall, aiming itself at Lucas. This is Detective Lucas Grant. I'm here to search the building after suspicious activity was brought to my attention, Lucas said to the light source. The light lowered out, and out of the darkness came a man in a police uniform. Lucas had never seen the man before. I know who you are, believe me. I've heard a lot. I discovered another body similar to how Neville's was. I was trying to call back on my walkie-talkie, but nobody answered back, he said. My name is Phineas Hunnigan, but I go by Finn. He reached out with his hand, expecting Lucas to shake it. Lucas completely ignored his gesture. All right, Finn, where's the body? Lucas grumbled. Finn moved his outstretched hand awkwardly back to his side and stumbled for words. Well, I found it in the room behind me here. It's inside the giant gift box in the back behind the counter. Take a look if you want. Lucas pushed Finn aside and examined the room before heading to the back. No traps were visible, no bombs, no nothing. 
It looked just as dusty as any other room in the building. Carefully he made his way over to the counter and over to the massive gift box. It was almost the size of him. It was huge. He wondered what would be inside of it. He expected a body. What could be worse? His mind wandered and stumbled over every possibility, though he couldn't have expected what was really inside. He grasped the top of the box and tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. It felt like it was attached to the rest of the box, like it couldn't open. It has to open, he thought, so he tried again. Nothing happened. Lucas shouted back to Finn. Hey, is this some kind of sick joke? It won't budge. Lucas sat in silence. There was no reply. Hey, I swear to... He started again. A voice burst through the restaurant's busted intercom, somehow still working. Lucas, Lucas, Lucas. We wouldn't want the music to stall for any longer, would we? Finn's voice said through the radio static. That's when it hit Lucas. That wasn't an officer. That was him. The killer and Lucas knew he wasn't getting out. He reached into his back pocket for his walkie-talkie, but it wasn't there. He ran for the counter, but the metal gate was shuttered down and locked from the opposite side. At first, Lucas thought he was going to starve to death here. That's how he would kill him. He was wrong. Music began to play from the intercom, twinkling like a music box would. Lucas knew the tune. It was Grandfather's Clock. It went fast and slow, as if it was being cranked by hand, and soon... Lucas would notice a faint purple light coming from behind him. The giant gift box was starting to open, its metal crank spinning along with the song. The purple light grew and grew until a purple flame leapt out of the box, spitting itself onto the floor. Flames crept onto the walls, the, to the toys still on the prize shelves, onto Lucas himself. He had no way of escaping, of putting out the flames. He had to watch, so he watched. When the box opened itself fully, the music stopped playing. The only thing Lucas heard was the flames desperately crawling up the building's walls. The silence terrified him further. A figure gracefully came from the box, unfurling into something horrific. It wasn't the body he was warned about. It was a slender black puppet, white stripes up and down its arms and legs, a pearly white mask with tears streaking down its face, a grin that spread across its lips. Its purple eyes are bright enough to pierce Lucas's soul. Lucas couldn't look away. He was no longer scared. Lucas began to cry. Lucas began to smile. And he swore, for a split second, he could hear the calming melody of Grandfather's Clock echoing in the distance as the world went away. I love it. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, I've, I've read all these stories before, obviously. I wouldn't have made the book if I hadn't read them. Um... But man, oh man, it, the main thing about this one was the ending for me. Um, a lot of it was written so well. Like, let's just take a few examples. Where was it? Uh, I mean, it was mainly just all of this. Uh, the description of the puppet was amazing. It wasn't the body he was warned about. It was a slender black puppet, white stripes up and down its arms and legs, a pearly white mask with tears streaking down its face, a grin that spread across its lips. Its purple eyes are bright enough to pierce Lucas's soul. It's that. That's amazing. It's also, um, like, th there's a sense of panic because you've used Lucas, the, like, what, like ten times in, like, five sentences? It's quite, it's quite clever. Uh, the, the fact that he did, Lucas couldn't look away. Lucas was no longer scared. Lucas began to cry. Lucas began to smile. And actually, it's those two lines there, Lucas began to cry, Lucas began to smile, that really get me uh, in my heart. That's incredible because it's like a it's a nice contrast. It's not exactly a juxtaposition, I don't think. Is it? I don't know. It might be. It might be a juxtaposition because Lucas began to cry, which is a sad thing. Lucas began to smile, which is like a happy thing. But it's they're both creepy. Um, and he swore for a split second he could hear the calming melody of Grandfather's Clock echoing in the distance as the world went away. I like how you how you didn't say Lucas died. You just said as the world went away. That's so. That's such a better way of putting it. Um, yeah, so speaking of Grandfather's Clock, the next story in this book is called My Grandfather's Clock, so make sure you stick around for that one. That one is actually incredible. <laughs> like, uh, this one was amazing, but the next one, uh, I, I actually... <laughs> you, you just have to read it to find out why I like it so much. Anyway, this was amazing. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, for making this story and well done for winning um everyone go praise him on discord and, and and everything anyway 
I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.